This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Here we are once again in our weekly teachings of the books of the Bible. Now this week, we're going to be teaching about the book of Joel and Zephaniah. They are the minor prophets to Judea. An overview of the books. We continue our series of exploring the books of the 12 minor prophets by looking at the books of Joel and Zephaniah. These prophets prophesied to Judah, although Zephaniah also prophesied to surrounding countries. So first we look at the book of Joel. The name Joel means the Lord is God. He is identified as the son of Pethuel, but little more. It's not clear when the book was written. There are no references to kings to associate the book with anyone. Some commentators suggest the book was written in the 9th century BC. Others assign it to the 4th or 5th century BC, after the Babylonian exile. Joel's use of the term the Greeks in chapter 3 verse 6 is often used to argue a later date, but the Greeks were known to have access to Judah from 1600 to 1100 BC. While Joel does not mention a king, neither do Jonah, Nahum and Habakkuk. So advocates for an early date place the book during the period the young Joash was being protected by Jehoiada the priest which is a range of 841 to 835 BC. The nations Joel refers to, and those he omits, also argue in favour of an early date. The academic debate continues, and may never be conclusively resolved. Joel focuses on the southern kingdom of Judah, and uses natural disasters to communicate spiritual truth. The locust plague is an allergy of a far greater spiritual catastrophe if Judah does not repent and return to the Lord. Images of disaster run through the book, but after the judgment is complete, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Thus Joel was the first prophet to develop the theme of the coming day of the Lord on God's people and on the nations. This was fulfilled in part by the destruction of Judah and the exile in Babylon, but still has a future aspect to be fulfilled. Peter quoted Joel 2:28 to 32 in Acts 2 verses 16 to 21 as being fulfilled in Pentecost, and Jesus quoted Joel in his Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24:29. There are three sections to the book of Joel. The first section is from chapter 1 through to verse 20 of chapter 1, which outlines the historic invasion and destruction. The second section is chapter 2, verses 1 to 17, which outlines the prophetic invasion and destruction. And the final section is from chapter 2, verse 18, through to chapter 3, verse 21, which outlines the restoration, covering the promised blessing and final triumph. The book of Joel opens with a call to the elders as to whether they have ever known such a disaster that is happening to them. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your ancestors? Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. A nation has invaded my land, a mighty armor without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my veins and ruins my fig trees. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white, moaning like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the bedroom of her youth. Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. The fields are ruined, the ground is dried up, the grain is destroyed, the new wine is dried up, the olive oil fails. The spare you farmers, wail you vine growers, grieve for the wheat and the barley. Because the harvest of the field is destroyed, the vine is dried up, and the fig tree is withered, the pomegranate and the palm and the apple tree, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the people's joy it withered away. The locusts are compared to a mighty army that has invaded the land. The disaster is so great, Joel calls for the priests to call for a holy fast and a sacred assembly. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. The day of the Lord can refer to a present judgment of God on his people, or on foreign nations, or to God's final judgment on all evil at the end of the age, nation and return of Christ. The use in verse 15 relates to judgment at that time, 
Later use of the term in the book of Joel refers to the final day of the Lord. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes, such as never was in ancient times, nor ever will be in ages to come. Before them fire devours, behind them a flame blazes, before them the land is like the Garden of Eden, behind them a desert waste. Nothing escapes them. They have the appearance of horses. They gallop along like cavalry. At the sight of them, nations are in anguish. Every face turns pale. They charge like warriors. They scale walls like soldiers. They all march in line, not swerving from their course. They rush upon the city. They run along the wall. They climb into the houses. Like thieves, they enter through the windows. Before them the earth shakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and moon are darkened, and the stars no longer shine. The Lord thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond number, and mighty is the army that obeys his command. The day of the Lord is great, it is dreadful. Who can endure it? Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rain your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and who relents from sending calamity. God calls for repentance, not a show of repentance, tearing their clothes, but real repentance, tearing our heart. This is the repentance God calls for. Not, I am sorry I got caught, next time I will make sure I am not caught. But David, Psalm 51. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Verse 16 outlines that everyone should answer the call to repentance, the nursing mother, the bride and groom, and they should be led in repentance by the priests. Following repentance by the people in line of Second Chronicles 7.14 Then the Lord was jealous for his land and took pity on his people. Do not be afraid, land of Judah. Be glad and rejoice. Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the autumn rains because he is faithful. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locusts, and the young locusts, the other locusts, and the locust swarms. My great army that I sent among you, you will have plenty to eat until you are full. And you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be ashamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. The Lord's reply covers the immediate and future destiny of Israel. This continues in verse 28 to 32, which looks both to Pentecost and to the final judgment. And afterwards, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servant, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance. As the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. In those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. There I will put them on trial for what they did to my inheritance, my people Israel, because they scattered my people among the nations and divided up my land. 
Let the nations be rose, let them advance in the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the nations on every side. Swing the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, trample the grapes, for the winepress is full and the vast overflow. So great is their wickedness. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will be darkened, and the stars no longer shine. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the heavens will tremble, for the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion. My holy hill, Jerusalem, will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her. In that day, the mountains will drip new wine, and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house, and will water the valley of Acacia. But Egypt will be desolate, Edom a desert waste, because of violence done to the people of Judah, in whose land they shed innocent blood. Judah will be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem to generations. Should I leave their innocent blood unavenged? No, I will not. The Lord dwells in Zion. Jerome concludes with the promise that in the future Jerusalem will be delivered from her enemies, and God will bless his people by dwelling among his people and showing them his love and care. The book of Zephaniah. Zephaniah, whose name means the Lord hides, prophesied during the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, between 640 and 609 BC. Zephaniah was the great-great-grandson of King Hezekiah and the only known prophet of royal descent. Zephaniah was a contemporary of Habakkuk and Jeremiah and had a ministry in Judah in the final years leading up to the fall of Jerusalem in 607 BC. Many of the sins Zephaniah prophesied against Judah indicate he prophesied before Josiah's reforms that started in about 627 BC and he may have been a factor in driving those reforms. Zephaniah is a book of warning not only about judgments that were fulfilled in ancient times against Judah and surrounding nations, but also about a future judgment on the entire earth. After this future judgment, all nations will call on the name of the Lord. Zephaniah focuses on two aspects of the day of the Lord. It's a day of wrath and it's a day of blessing. The book of Zephaniah has three sections. The first, the worldwide judgment and judgment on Judah, chapters 1, 1 to 2, 3. The second section is from judgment on Judah to judgment on Jerusalem, from chapter 2, verse 4 to chapter 3, verse 7. And the third section is from the judgment and purification of the Gentiles to the renewal and blessing of Israel, which goes from chapters 3, verses 8 to uh, chapter 3, verse 20. The book starts by Zephaniah prophesying coming destruction. I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away both man and beast. I will sweep away the birds in the sky, and the fish in the sea, and the idols that cause the wicked to stumble. When I destroy all mankind on the face of the earth, declares the Lord, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all who live in Jerusalem. I will destroy every remnant of Baal worship in this place. The very names of the idolatrous priests, those who bow down, on the roofs to worship the starry host, those who bow down and swear by the Lord and who also swear by Molech, those who turn back from following the Lord and neither seek the Lord nor inquire of him. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish those who are complacent, who are like wine left on its drinks, who think the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. Their wealth will be plundered, their houses demolished. Though they build houses, they will not live in them. Though they plant vineyards, they will not drink the wine. The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. The cry on the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty warrior shouts his battle cry. That day will be a day of wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. I will bring such distress on all people that will group about like those who are blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like dust 
and the entrails like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his jealousy the whole earth will be consumed, for he will make a sudden end of all who live on the earth. Zephaniah goes on to call for repentance. In chapter 2, Gather together, gather yourselves together, you shameful nation, before the decree takes effect, and that day passes like wind-blown chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's wrath comes upon you. Seek the Lord, O you humble of the land, you who do what he commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. Only seeking repentance will save Judah. This is what they will get in return for their pride, for insulting and mocking the people of the Lord Almighty. The Lord will be awesome to them when he destroys all the gods of the earth. Distant nations will bow down to him, all of them in their own lands. This prophecy is against the Philistine cities and Moab, Ammon, Cush and Assyria. Then Zephaniah turns to judgment on Jerusalem. But it's become evident that most of Judah will not repent, and so Zephaniah pronounces a woe oracle over them. Woe to the city of oppressors, rebellious and defiled. She obeys no one, she accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord, she does not draw near to her God. Her officials within her are roaring lions. Her rulers are evening wolves who leave nothing for the morning. Her prophets are unprincipled, they're treacherous people. Her priests profane the sanctuary and do violence to the law. God declares, I have destroyed nations. Their strongholds are demolished. I have left their streets deserted, with no one passing through. Their cities are laid waste. They are deserted and empty. Of Jerusalem I thought, surely you will fear me and accept correction. Then her place of refuge would not be destroyed, nor all my punishments come upon her. But they were still eager to act corruptly in all they did. Therefore, wait for me, declares the Lord. For the day I will stand up to testify. I have decided to assemble the nations, to gather the kingdoms, and to pour my wrath on them. All my fears anger. The whole world will be consumed by the fire of my jealous anger. God will assemble and testify against all nations. But judgment is not God's final word. His salvation comes after the destruction of those who have not repented. Then I will purify the lips of the people, that all of them may call on the name of the Lord and serve him shoulder to shoulder. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshippers, my scattered people, will bring me offerings. On that day you, Jerusalem, will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me because I will remove from you your arrogant boasters. Never again will you be haunty on my holy hill, but I will leave within you the meek and humble. The remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouth. They will eat and lie down, and no one will make them afraid. Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment, has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion, do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I will remove from you all the mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and reproach for you. At that time, I will deal with all who oppress you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. So in conclusion, Zephaniah takes us through the warning for God's chosen people and for all nations. The warnings turn to judgments and punishments, but end with the restoration and God's provision. Our society today seems to echo the cry in Zephaniah 1.12. The Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. What determines how far down this road we go? Only the degree that we repent of our sins. We cannot be cleansed of our sin by our own efforts, but only by accepting the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ will we be in the remnant that enjoys God's blessings on the future day of the Lord. And so to conclude on the books of both Joel and Zephaniah, both prophets foretold coming disaster against a sinning Judah. 
But they also foretold coming blessings and restoration. Today we face the same position. The book of Revelation makes it clear that there's a coming day of judgment for all mankind. But it also tells us that the way we are saved is according to Acts 16.31. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And so that's what we need to do today. We need to believe in the Lord Jesus to avoid the wrath of the coming day of the Lord. And the Bible is very clear in how we believe in the Lord Jesus. We just need to pray a prayer to accept him as Lord of our lives and to repent of the sins and declare that we're going to turn away from the sins that we have committed and follow the path of God. So if you'd like to pray this prayer with us. Heavenly Father, we come before you today as sinners, but we repent of our sin. We acknowledge that we've strayed away from you, but now, Father God, we want to return to the fold. We want to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour, and we confess with our mouths that he is Lord of our lives. And we believe in our hearts that you raised him from the dead on the third day, and that he now sits on your right hand interceding for us. And so, Father God, I declare that I will seek out a church to become a member, that I will spend time in your word, reading it, and time in your presence through prayer. And I give you all the glory and honor and praise that I am now a born-again Christian, and I turn away from that life of sin and walk into your arms and the kingdom of God. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yes, and as we were teaching God's word, what he's saying about I call it the end times, what we are living in right now. The book of Joel, he talks about the coming of the Lord, the last day. And even today, there's so many things that's happening. There's so much fire and so much doubt. Some probably think that, you know, they are waiting in great anticipation of the Lord returning. But that is not as yet. The prophet Joel, he gives us an insight of what is about to take place even as we go about our daily lives. And we have to be mindful that in spite of who we are, there will be a day of repentance of the things that have been said or done that's pleasing to the Lord because God is holy and there's none like him. Well, in fact, the meaning of the book, Joel, he said, the Lord is God. So it is vital and especially in this book, God emphasizes that on his day, there is judgment. He will pour out wrath upon those that have been saying or doing things that displeases him. God is a God of compassion. He's a God of love. But at the same time, God is a God of wrath. For those that are even complacent, um, concerning, teaching, or doing godly deeds, those that are not walking the way that intended for them to walk, those that are not fulfilling the purpose and plan that God has called them to do, Everything is being taken note of because we always have to be mindful that God sees all and he knows all and there's nothing hidden from him. On the day of judgment, because God is in control of everything and it's only one way that we can be saved. And like my husband said, the prayer of salvation. And not so just saying the prayer, but believing in your heart, a true repentance because all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God understands that. Yes, we are. But mere man. But at the same time, God is a God of healing. He's a God of deliverance. Most of all, he's a God of restoration. And he will always make a way where we're given the privilege and opportunity to come back where we should be. To be repositioned back into the fold, into the kingdom of God. So we're able to fulfill our lives in a rightful manner. We're able to have complete access to what God had intended for us to, to live our life by. And it's not so just for us, but also our children and the generations to follow. It is not so just much for us to be repentant, but also we are to teach the word of God and minister them to our children. He said to train them up so the children themselves will know the God that we serve and God's desire for all to be saved, none to perish. And because his love is unending, he desire to bless us, but also to keep our eyes and our hearts and our minds on him. And keeping our eyes and our hearts and our mind fixed and stayed on him, we accomplish everything. Because even with the things that we see in the natural is temporary, but on the judgment day, it's eternal. 
everlasting joy and peace. And I know that's for each and every one of us. Desire. In the book of Zephaniah, God has got a restoration. And he's willing above all that we prosper. But nothing is hidden from his eyes. Everything will have to be in alignment according to his will and his way for our lives. He loves us, but he will not compromise his word for nobody. And I pray that even the teachings of Joel and Zephaniah, as we live our lives, I pray that you continue to, to seek God's face, to seek his heart. And as you do those things, God will continue to allow you to see things from his perspective and to hear his voice. And he will continue to give you the endurance and the strength to persevere, even at times if obstacles and situations presents itself to us. We are to be mindful that God is all powerful and the greater power lies within us. So we're able to triumph over the situation and be victorious in the name of Jesus. And God is saying he loves you. He loves all of us, but he hates to sin. And it's no matter who we are, God is still God. And besides him, is none else. And it's a time and a season for everything to be completed. And we say to God be the glory for great things he has done for us. He's doing right now. But yet, especially what he's about to do to demonstrate the sovereignty of who he is. There's none like him. God bless you all. Amen.